So from this point, 6 and 64, then more researchers started to use microscopes, magnifying glasses, to see what is not seen with the naked eye. And it became a favorite tool for scientists, a very important tool in research laboratories around the world. And actually, many scientists, they wanted to have their painting drawn with the microscope in front of them. It was the most valuable piece of equipment in the research laboratory. And today, well, when you have your picture taken in the laboratory, you want the microscope there with you. And in fact, you know, the symbol for science is often a microscope like this one. But then the question is, how does the microscope actually work? Well, one didn't know that at, at 1664. Uh, it took a few hundred years before we got the wave theory for light, describing light as a wave form. And with that notion of light as a wave, it was possible to start to calculate and uh, design optics based on the wave form. And then uh, optical physicists and optical engineers started to, uh, to, to work with the theory. And uh, Ernst Abbe in Germany, he um, came up with an equation in 1873 that described how good a microscope can be. And what is good in a microscope? Well, that is not how much it magnifies. It is how good it is to resolve. And resolution, that is about, you have two points. If you look at two points, in the microscope. How close can they be? And you still see them as two points. And that is what this equation states. D here, that's the distance between the two objects, when we still see them as two and not one overlapping. Lambda, that is the wavelength of light. And then divided by some optical parameters, to be divided by two. So a rough estimate for the, how perfect the microscope can be is that it can resolve objects that are down to about 200 nanometers apart. The importance of this equation is also seen in that it is written in stone. So this is a picture from a stone outside the university in Jena, where Ernst Abbe was active. And then about 100 years ago, when this campus was built, then the microscopes were actually that good, the optics were that good in the microscope that we were very close to the resolution limit. So with such a microscope, um, if we then look at the cell, this is what we see. Uh, we see a shadow image of the cell. It's hard to actually see the cell. And that's because one thing is that it's very small. The diameter of the cell here is about 10 to 20 micrometers. And in comparison, a human hair is 100 microns. And also the cell is basically transparent. This is a single cell. And if you look at something very small and it's transparent, well, you just see a shadow image of it. But we can distinguish the nucleus of the cell and some other structures here, but we can't really tell what's in there, which molecules are there, which proteins are there. So there was another invention that was needed to make the microscope you know, into what we have today as a really re useful research tool. And that was uh, fluorescence. Fluorescence uh, was discovered and described the first time by George Stokes in 1852. And it's a molecular principle, or a, a function of molecules, where you illuminate the molecules with short wavelength light. They take up the light and then re-emit light as a longer wavelength. So you illuminate a molecule with, say, green light, and you get red light out from it. And by that way, you can create contrast. That was described by George Stokes in 1852. And then it was combined, fluorescent molecules were combined with antibodies by Albert Kuhns in 1941. And that started then the field of immunofluorescence, which is so important in microscopy and in other fields of, of bioanalytics. So with the antibodies, we can then put a color, a fluorescent color, on a specific molecule in a sample. We can label a one type of proteins with green color, another type with blue and red and so on. And then we can look at them in the microscope, in a fluorescence microscope. So if we have our cell that we look at in a normal light microscope, and then we turn on fluorescence, well, then you suddenly see the cell in much higher contrast. And we can distinguish different structures in the cell. So what we have here is in red, that are the mitochondria, 
the power stations of the cell where sugar is converted into energy that is so necessary for all life. We have DNA in the nucleus in gray. In green and blue, we have parts of the cytoskeleton or the skeleton of the cell that build it up. So it's a nice image, but it is a bit fuzzy, blurred. It looks like part of it is out of focus. And that is because when you look at the cell in the microscope, it is a three-dimensional object. And just like with a camera, when you take a picture, you have something that is in focus and things that are out of focus. And all of that contribute to the picture. And that happens in the microscope too. So we have things that are out of focus here that kind of disturb the image. We don't see all the details as, as well as we would like to. Luckily, there, there is a solution to that. It was an optical uh, principle that was invented in the 50s, but in the 50s, nobody could build a microscope based on it. It was not until in the 80s, when we had lasers, computers, sensitive detectors, and clever engineering by people here at KTH that combined those techniques into functional 3D confocal scanning laser microscopes. So in, in to be honest, in parallel at several places around the world, this was done. But here at KTH, for the first time, Nils Åslund and Kjell Karlsson, they recorded a three-dimensional image of a nerve cell and published that. So the microscope that they built was this one. It's a confocal microscope. It was sold uh, later on as, uh, as uh, the Sarastro uh, microscope to laboratories around the world. And confocal microscopy is now then a kind of standard technique that is used in, in most cell biological laboratories. So what happens then in the confocal microscope? Why is it so good? So we go back to the normal fluorescence image. You see the blur, and then we turn on the confocal microscope, and you see the details. So it gives high resolution. Still, our best law is there and, and limit the resolution, but it gives higher resolution it takes away everything that is out of focus. So we only see what is in the focal plane of, 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 of the microscope. So we do optical slicing. So we are looking at thin layers of a 3D object and can then record a full three-dimensional volume and create 3D images of what we're looking at. So as I said, it was a combination of lasers and computers and, and, and the sensitive detectors that led to the development of confocal microscopy or modern microscopy. But in the center of it, it is always the microscope. Now, the centerpiece is the microscope, the same optical arrangement of lenses and so on. What has been changed is how we send in light in the microscope, how we manage the different lasers that illuminate the sample, the detectors that we use. We have detectors now that can sense a single photon, detect when it arrives, to the detector. So we have a development towards higher resolution, trying to push the limits that still are in effect by, by Ernst Labbe when it comes to normal imaging. Uh, pushing the sensitivity so we can detect single molecules, single photons, single molecules, and higher specificity so we know which molecule we are detecting in the microscope. And of course, the technique is now computerized. We use digital imaging, and we can then do a lot of advanced analytics of it. We can study uh, intracellular ions in the cells, the dynamics of, of intracellular ions, or the dynamics of cells in motion, or components of the cells in motion. We can study molecular interactions, and so on. So I have here a couple of examples of what can be done with modern confocal microscopes. First here is a recording. This is recorded over 48 hours, then compressed in time so we can see it, uh, of uh, human cells where they have been labeled with a fluorescent protein that changes color as the cells mature and divide. So you see they go from green to yellow to red. Well, they went. Uh, this was made possible by combining the confocal microscope with an incubator. So we create an atmosphere inside the microscope where the cells thrive and, 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 and like it. Another example is this. This is one cell, and what you see crawling around here, like worms, that are the mitochondria. Let's see if we can play it again. And you see the mitochondria here, they are highly dynamic. They are moving around in the cell in three dimensions. 
And we actually don't understand yet why they are doing this. So this is part of an ongoing research project that we're doing right now. And then going to another example where we go down to the molecular level. Uh, in a neuron, we have synapses, the contact points between neurons where signals are transmitted, and they are then filled with different types of receptors and different proteins. And the question is then, which molecules are there? How do they get there? And what is the dynamics there? How, how does a neuron change its sensitivity to signals and so on? And then we can study by combining nanotechnology, nanoparticles, with confocal microscopy. So it's hard to see, but here we have a magnification of a nerve cell. In green and red, we have the synapses, small structures that are about 200 nanometers. And as we record over time, we can then follow where are the nanoparticles, because the nanoparticles, they are attached to single proteins. And we can then follow how the nanoparticles are moving in and out of different synapses. So we can study dynamics on the cellular level, subcellular level, and even on the molecular level with the microscopes that we have today. But those examples have all been based on conventional microscopy, where the laws that Abbe put up in 1873 are in effect, saying that we can't see objects that are in a shorter distance than 200 nanometers from each other. But 200 nanometers that, that's a long distance when it comes to biology, because a protein is about 5 to 10 nanometers, and biology takes place here, on this distance. So there's a need in biology to be able to see on this distance, short distance. Of course, one can go to electron microscopy, where it's possible to see smaller objects, but there are limitations in electron microscopy, and we don't have time to go into that now. So it has been a driving force then for optical physicists and, and, and engineers to try to find ways to image smaller than Abbe dictates. And that was made possible about 10 years ago with the invention of super-resolution microscopy, uh, a technique where it is not the wave nature of light that dictates how small objects you can see. Instead, you use the features of fluorescence, fluorescent molecules, that you can turn fluorescent molecules on and off you can control that, that made it possible to find higher resolution and, and go, so to speak, say that Abbe is no longer important for what we can see. Um, there are two, two main techniques. One is based on combining laser beams in the microscope in a clever way to turn molecules on and off. And the other technique is based on stochastic or random switching of molecules. They are blinking in the microscope. Clever techniques that uh, gave the Nobel Prize then to Betzig, Murner, and Hell in 2004. 14. So an example then of what can be done see, uh, using this technique. The first example is a neuron again. Here we just see, here we just see a dendrite that is the thin structure that holds the synapses. It is about one micrometer across here, so it's a tiny structure. And we have labeled with two different colors, two different proteins in this structure. And we're interested in seeing how are they located in the synapse. The synapse and the spine, it is of a dimension that is not possible to see the details with normal microscopy. So using then the blinking or single molecule localization microscopy technique, we can zoom in and actually see within this 200 nanometer structure location of individual molecules. We can count them and see how they cluster, how they organize uh, uh, against each other. Yeah. That was the single molecule localization microscopy. And now we talk about STED microscopy, the technique where we combine different laser beams in the microscope in a clever fashion to turn fluorescence on and off. It is based on confocal microscopy, uh, so this is a picture using the confocal microscope of mitochondria in red and cytoskeleton in green. And we can see the structure of mitochondria. They are, say, 300 nanometers across. So it is possible to see them. We can see how they bend and so on, but we see no details about their structure. When we turn on the STED microscope, then we see details of the mitochondria and we see finer details of the cytoskeleton. We actually see so much detail so we can label 
different proteins on the membrane of the mitochondria. We have labeled here with magenta and green in different colors, two different proteins, and we can localize where on the mitochondrial membrane the proteins are. And this is, of course, very important because this is where sugar is converted to energy. And figuring out how that works is, is then, of course, of importance. So, with that, I would like to say that the, the techniques that I've described, they are all available here at KTH. We are developing the techniques. We're developing super-resolution microscopy techniques, both the microscopes and the methods to use them for life science research. Um, I have described that the microscope, it has been the centerpiece of laboratories for 400 years. And the first 400 years, it was limited by the laws of, 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 of of diffraction and, and, uh, and the resolution limits. And now we enter a new era, another 400 years, where that law is no longer in, in place. So I believe that for the next 400 years, this microscope will continue to be the centerpiece of the laboratory and the researcher's best friend. With that, I thank you.